Hello, and welcome to the podcast, Buffy and the Art of Stories, Season 3, and Happy New Year. I hope your year is starting well. If you love Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and you love creating stories, or just taking them apart to see how they work, you're in the right place. I am Lisa M. Lilly, author of the Awakening Supernatural Thriller series and the QC Davis Mysteries, and founder of writingasasecondcareer.com. Today I'll be talking about Earshot Season 3, Episode 18. This is the episode that was delayed in airing due to the Columbine High School shooting in 1999. In particular, I'll talk about a different kind of audience mislead than we saw in Enemies, the role of happenstance and luck in a story, what happens when you sideline your protagonist, and how rewriting and revisions heighten the dialogue and theme here. As always, there will be no spoilers except at the end to talk about foreshadowing, but I'll give you plenty of warning. Okay, let's dive into the Hellmouth. Earshot was written by Jane Espenson and directed by Regis Kimball. The original air date for Earshot was meant to be April 21, 1999, after Enemies, but it was first broadcast out of sequence immediately before season four of Buffy started. The Columbine shooting occurred on April 20, 1999, the day before Earshot would have aired and as we go through it's clear not just the subject matter but some of the lines are the reasons they would not have wanted to air this the day after. We start with opening conflict. Buffy runs through a park at night. A demon is chasing her. She falls seeming vulnerable but when it approaches she is ready for it and she kicks and says you demons can't resist a run and stumble can you? She fights and eventually stabs the demon to death. Its silver blood gets on her hand which she doesn't pay much attention to as she is more concerned about the second demon, just like the first, that ran away. And we go to credits. That's only at one minute, one second in, so it is the opposite of what we saw in Enemies in the last episode, which was over five minutes before we got to credits, and here it's just one. When we come back, Buffy tells Willow about the second demon getting away and also how a nervous it was that the demons had no mouths. They're walking into the library. Oz and Xander are sitting at the tables helping with research. Giles says they've been researching the Ascension and they've eliminated various possibilities including that the demon Azeroth and then he cuts off and says he doesn't know what's going to happen. And Buffy says, you don't know anything? The whole Faith Angel thing was for nothing? Giles says at least it brought Faith's treachery out into the open, and they have some information on the Ascension that could be useful. This is really nice, quick exposition through conflict. Giles' frustration over not knowing more, Buffy's distress that she went through all of this emotional pain and fear, and it didn't get them very much. In the scene-by-scene commentary on the DVD by Jane Aspenson, she said that the writers, when they were creating this episode, didn't know yet exactly what would happen at the end, what the ascension would be. And so they were poking a little bit of fun at themselves about that. That can be a good writing technique. Sometimes it works if you are struggling with something with the plot or another story issue to call it out in the story to have the characters reflect on it. Obviously you can't do that all the time but I think this shows that you, maybe they were both themselves frustrated and they thought the viewers might be frustrated not knowing more so they worked it into the plot that Giles and Wesley are frustrated and coming up short and they even make it a bit funny in a moment. Buffy is scratching her hand where that demon blood got on it as everyone is talking. Wesley comes in. He just met with the council and he's a little bit pompous as Wesley can be and kind of making fun at Giles not knowing much. So Giles says, 
Well, he's sure that with the resources of the council at Wesley's disposal, Wesley will be able to add so much. Wesley takes his place at the head of the table and says he is pleased to state that the demon Azeroth won't be, and everybody gets up and leaves. In the hallway, Willow asks if Buffy has talked to Angel. She says not really, that seeing him even pretend bad and with faith was really hard. Willow reassures her that Angel did it for the greater good, but Buffy is not so sure. She says to the naked eye, it looked like fun. So more quick reminders about the last episode through minor conflict between Willow and Buffy. A couple basketball players come down the hall, including Percy, who tells Willow he can't make their study session that they planned, but he can meet with her later. And it's this nice callback to Doppelgangland when Willow started tutoring Percy. It also gives Willow a reason in another moment to be going to the basketball game. Percy's friend Hogan says to Willow, I don't know what you're doing to him. I actually heard him complete a sentence. It had a clause and everything. Percy says he'll see Willow at the game and Buffy's surprised that Willow is going, but Willow says she's been getting into it and it's exciting now that they're in the championship and everybody is going, including Oz and Sander and Willow. And Buffy says, great, everybody who isn't currently Buffy. We're now about 10% through, a little bit past, and that is usually where we see our inciting incident or story spark that sets our plot in motion. At 5 minutes 23 seconds, we're at the library and Buffy tells Giles about her hand itching. He shows her a drawing of the demon and reading the text tells her that these demons can infect the host. He's continuing to read, and Buffy says, in fact, in fact, Giles, in fact, he tells her it's infecting with an aspect of the demon, but he doesn't know exactly what that means, and he tells her, don't worry, but best to limit her exposure, so don't track the second one. So this spark did come a little bit later than usual, but I think that it works because from that moment that that silver blood sinks into Buffy's hand, we are worried for her. Outside at a pep rally, the cheerleaders are cheering, including Cordelia. Willow and Buffy are standing to one side along with Oz and Xander, and Willow talks about the school newspaper editor, Freddie, whose latest editorial about the cheerleaders says something like they're there to drive guys into a sexual frenzy to then expend in pointless athletic competition. And Willow asks if Oz has noticed that the school paper is really depressing lately, and Oz has a great line. He says, I don't know. I always go straight to the obits. Jane Espenson commented that Oz is hard to write for because he says so little and then everything he says has to be pithy. I love this comment because it highlights that often writers have to write characters who are different from them, who might be particularly quick-witted or always make this amazing observation. And that doesn't mean that it is coming that easily to the writer. But through the magic of rewriting, you can get to that point. And I imagine with Oz, there probably was a fair amount of reworking of lines to get those amazing comments from him. Xander and Oz are watching the cheerleaders and Xander says he looks at all these girls and wonders why he ever wasted time on Cordelia and he goes on look at her she's no better looking than the rest of them. Oz responds none of them are really my but Xander cuts him off because he sees Wesley who is walking up the stairs pause to look at the cheerleaders and Xander says oh my god he's looking at her he's got his filthy adult Pierce Brosnan any eyes all over my cordy and Oz responds you're a very complex man aren't you I did look up some photos of a younger Pierce Brosnan and there is a resemblance to the actor who plays Wesley Buffy is worried about getting a demon part claws or scales but she is also scared about turning into something that's not 
her. She's more vulnerable than we usually see her and more expressive about her emotions. But Willow interrupts her to cheer for the team, especially for Percy. She then apologizes and she says she heard Buffy and Willow would be worried too, but she is sure that Buffy will be okay. Buffy walks home alone at night. She stops to look at herself in a small makeup mirror and check for changes to her face or horns on her head. Angel startles her a little by coming up behind her, and of course she can't see him in the mirror. She asks what he's doing there. He says he's there because it's a dangerous time with Faith and he wanted to be sure Buffy's okay and safe. Buffy wants to know, is he tracking her or tracking Faith? Is Faith around because Angel is there? Then she apologizes for being snippy with him and tells him she's worried about the aspect of the demon. He's familiar with that and says it could be a rumor that sometimes demons exaggerate their powers to scare people and Buffy comments on demon hype. Who knew? She says, all her time is spent in the dark anyway so what difference does it make if she looks awful with her new monster part angel reassures her and he tells her i'll love you even if you're covered with slime she liked all but the last part of that the next day willow oz and xander are talking about how exciting the game was they stop abruptly when buffy walks over and they pretend the game was dull cordelia though goes by and says are you guys crazy it was an incredible game we are now approaching one quarter way through the episode that is where we typically see our first major plot turn that comes from outside the protagonist spins the story in a new direction and raises the stakes and here we have an almost classic one quarter turn though we don't know that it raises the stakes right away as the episode plays out we'll see that it does at 12 minutes 10 seconds in xander looks at cordelia and thinks i wonder if she and wesley have kissed buffy answers as if he said it out loud and says something about how it really bugs him doesn't it the idea of wesley and cordelia kissing and xander says man you read my mind the look on buffy's face tells us that it just hit her that she did read his mind next buffy is walking in the hall Hall. She hears a teacher's negative thoughts about students, something about if they could just get rid of all the students, a girl's self-talk about taking French and how stupid it was to take it, and a lot of boys' thoughts about sex and about Buffy. In the DVD commentary, Jane Espenson talked about how the idea for this episode came about and I found it fascinating because often this is how ideas begin with me with just a germ of something that often ends up becoming another thing entirely and she said she pitched a whole bunch of episodes to Joss Whedon and David Greenwalt they didn't like any of them and at the end she said well I have this one it's about someone having psychic abilities and using them to cheat on a test Joss and David both like that one, and eventually it turned into Earshot, which has nothing to do with cheating on a test, though we will see a classroom scene in a moment. In the library, Buffy says to Giles, is this the thing, the aspect thing? She is really excited. This is way better than a tale. Giles is skeptical. He thinks maybe she's projecting what she believes others are thinking. And Buffy says, when I walked in a few minutes ago, you thought, look at her shoes. If a fashion magazine told her to, she'd wear cat strap to her feet. This is another line Jane Espenson commented on. She said she reworked it significantly. It started with Giles saying something very quirky and British and Buffy making fun of that and Joss told her she could find something better and eventually she remembered some shoes the costume department had put on Sarah Michelle Geller that she thought were sort of ridiculous and she called back to them in this line next Buffy reads Giles mind about the demons being telepathic and that's why they don't need mouths she also tells him Principal Snyder has walk like an Egyptian stuck in his head Giles talks about how useful the power could be, for instance, in anticipating an opponent's every move in a fight. And Buffy says, oh, way better than that. We switch to English class. 
The class is talking about Othello and Iago. Buffy reads the teacher's thoughts and gives insightful answers, including ones taken right from the teacher's dissertation. Espenson commented that the original scene was a history class, and they were talking about Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, and Joss wanted it to reflect more directly Buffy and Angel and Buffy's fears about Angel with Faith. Jane switched it to a Catcher in the Rye reference that she said she somehow connected and then Joss rewrote it to be Othello and Iago and talk directly about jealousy. Jane also commented the scene is there partly to show us all these different students and suspects. And we get some fun thoughts from Willow and Xander as Buffy is answering Willow thinks Buffy did the reading? Buffy understood the reading? And Xander thinks, when did she study? Was I supposed to study? Then he thinks the teacher is kind of hot. Another classmate, Nancy, is upset. And throughout, she keeps thinking when Buffy says something um, key, she thinks, I knew that or I could have said that. We see Nancy a couple times more, and she is a little annoying. And yet, I think a lot of us can relate to that. At least I can. There were often times in classes that... I did know the answer, but I I wasn't sure. And then someone else would say it, and I would think, oh, I should have said something. Maybe surprisingly, because I, I later went on to be a lawyer who really enjoys talking in court. I teach. Uh, pretty much give me a topic. I will stand up and talk about it in front of people. But I did not feel that way when I started law school. And what made me the most nervous was the idea of speaking in front of people. Another student critiques the students in his head, comparing them to pigeons scrambling for bread crusts as they scramble for the teacher's approval. Buffy asks Willow who he is, and Willow tells her Freddie Iverson. He writes the editorials for the student paper. The teacher then talks about Othello's readiness to believe Iago and believe that Desdemona has been unfaithful. And she comments on our internal Iagos that tell us our partners don't really love us. This is a great segue because we switch to Buffy going to Angel's. As she comes in, she accidentally lets daylight in and he jumps back. And she apologizes for coming in the daytime and says, I just ducked out of school and that's when they have it. We're about 16 and a half minutes in. Buffy keeps saying things about faith. It's kind of awkward. And then she pauses and looks closely at Angel. And he finally says, you can't get into my mind. And Buffy responds, how did you? Why not? He tells her it's like a mirror, his thoughts cast no reflection. And it's just it just hit me that that is probably why we had that moment where Buffy looks at herself in the mirror on the street and doesn't see Angel behind her. He asks her what she wants to know, how he felt kissing Faith, pretending to have no soul, watching Buffy suffer. Uh, and she says something like, well, now that you bring it up, and he tells her he hated hurting her. Buffy says she would understand if he was attracted to Faith. She has that whole bad girl thing working for her. Angel tells Buffy he doesn't want a bad girl. He had that already. He's been with dozens of girls like that. More. And Buffy says, oh, this honesty stuff is fun. Angel tells her he's 240 years old and he loved only one person. Buffy. She feels better. He tells her to be careful with this gift, that things that seem strong and powerful can be dangerous. And Jane Espenson said this was essentially the theme of the episode, or one of them, that it's a be careful what you wish for episode, much like Band Candy, where Buffy in the beginning was wishing to have less adult interference in her life, basically to not have these adults around, and then she saw what it was like if they all became like teenagers. So here, there is a line Buffy says in a moment about how it feels like all these doors are opening and she can just walk right in and she's excited about it but then later when it's overwhelming it reverses and she says it's like people can walk into my head and she can't keep them out we switch to the library Xander is upset that Buffy can read minds and this is the beginning of a reversal for Buffy (laughs) 
Today's episode of Buffy and the Art of Story is sponsored appropriately by Buffy and the Art of Story, not the podcast, but the books. You can get, if you would like to revisit season one, Buffy and the Art of Story season one, writing better fiction by watching Buffy, but you can also now get Buffy and the Art of Story, Season 2, Part 1, Threats, Lies, and Surprises in Episodes 1 through 11. You can also listen to all the back episodes at lisalily.com. That's Lisa, L-I-S-A, Lily, L-I-L-L-Y, dot com, where you can find books on writing craft and my supernatural thrillers and mysteries. Cordelia is the only one who is not upset by Buffy reading minds. She thinks, I don't see what this has to do with me. And then she says, I don't see what this has to do with me. Willow tries to say this new power is great and to be supportive, but inside she is thinking that Buffy is hardly human anymore. How can Willow be her friend? She won't need Willow for anything, and Buffy says she does need her. Don't think that. Oz is very philosophical and thinks, I am my thoughts. If they exist in her, Buffy contains everything that is me. Then she becomes me, and I cease to exist. And he says, hmm... Jane Espenson said initially she wrote something that was also very Oz-like with a sort of twisting logic, but Joss came back and told her to have him think what Nietzsche would think. And later we get more of this philosophizing where Oz thinks about how Buffy will encompass everyone's thoughts and everyone will cease to exist. Xander worries that he thinks about sex all the time and Buffy will hear him and he starts saying the multiplication table in his head to distract himself and he gets the answers wrong and then he keeps thinking of sex anyway including naked Buffy and Buffy says God Xander is that all you think about Xander responds actually bye and runs out we're at 20 minutes 25 seconds in Wesley says Xander illustrated a problem they're all likely to think exactly what they least want Buffy to hear it's a question of mental discipline Giles agrees, and then Wesley thinks, look at Cordelia, and then thinks, no, don't look at Cordelia. She's a student. Oh, I am bad. I'm a bad, bad man. Buffy smiles at him, and he excuses himself and goes into Giles' office. Buffy tells Willow it's kind of cool, and this is where she compares it to all these doors opening. Willow, though, worries in her head about Buffy knowing Oz better than Willow does, because Willow never knows what Oz is thinking. Buffy tries to make her feel better, but Willow apologizes and leaves, and Oz follows and Buffy says guess I won't be writing that book winning friends through telepathy Wesley calls out to ask if she can still hear him thinking if so he can leave and Buffy says she's getting a headache she'll go that's at 21 minutes 46 seconds in so we're right at the midpoint of the episode usually here we see a major reversal for the protagonist or the protagonist making a commitment to the quest going all in throwing caution to the wind so here we have a reversal for Buffy it's it's pretty major she's driven her friends away and it will escalate in a bit and become truly major later she walks in the hall again and now she hears more thoughts than before mostly everyone's insecurities uh, people are thinking no one's ever going to love me they worry about tests their appearance school we switch back to the library Giles is reading and tells Wesley this happened before to a man in Ecuador but they can't call to ask him about it because he's in complete isolation he can't shut off the power in the cafeteria, we see an example of that. Buffy is standing in line next to Jonathan. He asks if she's done with the mashed potatoes because she has sort of frozen in place and she just stares at him. Jonathan thinks she doesn't even know I'm here. There are more voices overwhelming Buffy as she walks into the seating area. She's moving slowly, one hand to her chest, the other gripping her tray, and she's looking around at everybody. 
seeming disoriented, and she hears a voice that cuts out all the others. This time tomorrow, I'll kill you all. And we cut to a commercial. This is 23 minutes, 27 seconds in. It's a great hook for a commercial, but it's part of why this episode feels a bit uneven to me. There is a lot that I love here every time I rewatch, but it's one of those episodes where I don't really look forward to rewatching it the way that I do most others. This voice is a major turn in the story and now the entire plot will shift to trying to prevent a mass murder, to find whoever said this or thought this. And at first I thought it might not work that well for me because it's a little bit late to be our midpoint and way too early for a three-quarter turn, that last major plot turn that spins the story again. But as I broke this down, I think it is more that we're at the middle of the episode and this turn doesn't grow out of Buffy's choices. It's more happenstance because she has the power, so she happens to hear this person having this thought. And coincidence or happenstance or luck, whether it's good or bad, can work really well to start a story. It can also work to send our protagonist off in a, in a wrong direction because it becomes an obstacle to the protagonist. But it works less well as a driving force once we are well into the story and particularly once we're at the middle. So I think that is part of what feels a bit unsatisfying to me about the episode as a whole. It is, though, very dramatic. After the commercial, Buffy drops her tray. She is so stunned. And then Uh, everyone claps and makes fun of her but she starts grabbing one person at a time staring at each one trying to figure out who had this thought so that is a bit of a commitment by Buffy to the quest but it overwhelms her and she puts her hands to her head and collapses which is now a truly major reversal we're at 23 minutes 27 seconds in and this sidelines Buffy another difficulty I have with the episode because normally by the middle of the episode I want to see the protagonist taking charge and driving forward and here in the middle she is essentially knocked out she does as a good protagonist should do her best to do what she can when she wakes up on the ground outside on her back uh, her friends have carried her out there she hears the thoughts of all her friends leaning over over her and she sits up and for the moment tells them she's okay and tells them what she heard and wants to start looking for whoever it is who's planning to do away with the whole school. Xander half jokes that he's been saying for years the lunch lady's out to get them with her mulligan stew and he says I mean what the hell is a mulligan? It's a joke that barely registered on first watch and is part of why I like re-watching because then I know that it's significant. At the time, I just found it funny because in my high school, we had many similarly named items at the cafeteria. Jane Espenson said that Joss insisted that there be a line early on about the lunch lady, something to cue people. Buffy can't say if the voice was male or female. She says it was hardly human. It was so full of anger and pain. And they ask if she's sure the person was serious. And Xander says, yeah, I mean, who hasn't idly thought about taking out the whole place with a semi-automatic? And they all just look at him and he says, I said idly. This line is clearly one of many reasons that it was a good choice not to, I, I would say the only choice, not to air this the day after the Columbine High School shooting. Looking at it now when there have been so many more tragedies, so many more high school shootings, my thought is probably this episode just wouldn't be done at all, or at least it would not be done this way. Buffy is sure the person was serious. She knows the difference. But now she is hearing everyone's thoughts and she asks if they cannot think so loud or so much. Giles says he will take her home. The others will work on figuring out who the person is. 
Buffy's very upset. She can't even be around people anymore. Giles tries to reassure her, but she hears him think, if it doesn't go away, she'll go insane. In the library, Willow uses information in the school database to try to rule out some of the students and teachers. As they talk about how people are getting gunned down in U.S. high schools, Oz says, it's bordering on trendy at this point. Another line you can see why was deeply disturbing and why the episode needed to be delayed. At 27 minutes in, though, we get one of my favorite scenes in all of Buffy. Joyce is trying to make Buffy comfortable in her room. Buffy's in pajamas. Joyce is getting her pillows. She offers to make her soup. And Buffy says, uh, wants Joyce to stay with her. And Joyce is making excuses. And Buffy says, you had sex with Giles? You had sex with Giles? And Joyce says, it was the candy. We were teenagers. And Buffy goes on, on the hood of a police car? Joyce says something like she hopes Buffy feels better. And Buffy says, twice? I love this scene. It's so much fun. And Jane Espenson commented that it was partly there because she was surprised to find out a lot of viewers were confused about how far things had gone between Giles and Joyce. She thought it was obvious from the reaction they had at the end of that episode where Buffy said at least she got to them before they did anything. I thought it was obvious too from their reactions that they did have sex. But I guess viewers were unsure. They were having conversations about this. And Jane said she loved the chance to let everyone know that Joyce and Giles did in fact have sex on the hood of that police car. In the library, Willow hands out assignments of people to interview. She yells at Cordelia and Xander for bickering, and she gives them sample questions to ask. Then we get a number of fun scenes while they question people. Willow questions Jonathan, a little callback to where she did that in Go Fish. And she says to him something like, fantasies are fun, aren't they? We all have fantasies where we're powerful and respected and people pay attention to us. And he says, maybe. Um, and she says something like, you see what I mean? And he says, uh, you want me to pay attention to you? In Willow's size. Oz interviews uh, the basketball player Hogan. He says it's for yearbook personality profiles and asks if Hogan ever feels like he created a false persona where he has to be perfect and popular and how much of a strain is that? And Hogan says something like, I guess moderate strain? Is that a good answer? I want to get this right. Cordelia asks a teacher if he plans on killing a bunch of people tomorrow and says, oh, it's for the yearbook. Xander is shown asking a group of girls about their perfect romantic evening. This threw me a bit because the other scenes are funny, but each person is truly trying to get answers. And then we have Xander using it as this way to hit on girls. And it it's not that I doubt Xander in some circumstances might do that. But this is supposed to happen tomorrow. And maybe this is one of those examples of how knowing about so many real life school shootings informs the episode because it it just, that just doesn't work for me. I'm used to tone shifts in Buffy and humor in tragedy, but this one just, it just feels off to me. Oz can't find Freddie Iverson, the editor of the newspaper, and as he looks in through the door, which is locked, he looks through the window, we see a bunch of headlines on clippings that are framed from Freddie's editorials. There's one that says, apathy on the rise, no one cares. And we see, after Oz leaves, Freddie is hiding under the desk. We are almost 30 minutes into the episode. We switch to nighttime. Buffy is hearing everyone's thoughts. She shuts her window and climbs into bed, holding the pillows over her ears. In the next scene, Giles and Wesley are working with a mortar and pestle. Wesley says it's coming along well. And then we have this marvelous line where Giles, in just his own dialogue, fills in what's happening. And there is conflict because he responds to Wesley saying things are coming along well by saying, Yes, Buffy's being driven mad. We have no proof this is going to work. And it still requires the heart of the second demon, which we have no idea how to get without the Slayer. 
And then we see Angel fighting the second demon, and he vamps out after it runs away and goes after it. We cut to Buffy. Joyce is with her. It's daytime now, and Buffy is whimpering. Then we see Willow questioning Nancy. I do enjoy Nancy's line. She says something like, do I often imagine classmates spying on me? Not till just now. At 32 minutes, 20 seconds in, Xander is asking Larry questions about his secret. Remember from the episode where it was revealed Oz was a werewolf, Xander had suspected Larry, and it turned out the secret Larry was hiding them was that he was gay. Larry assumed that Xander also was gay because Xander talked about knowing how Larry felt, and now Larry quite openly says he doesn't have any secret. He's out. He's so out his grandmother is fixing him up on dates, but he's very sympathetic. He says it sounds like Xander is struggling and suggests that Freddie, the guy at the newspaper, could do a tasteful coming out announcement for him. So there is that switch in tone here from the seriousness to this uh, humor coming out of misunderstanding. But it works a, a little better for me here because Xander is actually asking questions, trying to figure out if Larry perhaps being frustrated with hiding who he is might be the killer, as they are asking pretty much everybody about. It also serves the purpose of reminding us, again, who Freddy is. Oz then knocks on the newspaper door, calls Freddy's name, and Freddy is around the corner and out of sight. The group meets again in the library, and Freddy is the only one they couldn't find to answer the questions. At 33 minutes, 24 seconds in, Joyce and Giles are in Buffy's bedroom doorway. Buffy is clearly in pain, can't even register what's going on. There's a knock on the door, and it's Angel, and he has this beaker of purple liquid. Presumably, the demon heart is part of that, and he has this blanket to shield himself from the sunlight. I was looking here for that three-quarter turn, that last major plot turn that typically grows from the midpoint and spins our story in another new direction. And that conversation with Larry happens around then, but that doesn't spin the story. We also see Freddy hiding, but that is not new. We have seen that already. We get the conversation with Giles and Wesley about how to save Buffy, and in a moment, those efforts will come to fruition and resolve Buffy's problem, but that doesn't exactly change the direction of the story itself. So all of these are kind of more developments in the same storylines we already have. And at 33 minutes, 31 seconds in, Angel goes into Buffy's room. He gives her the liquid to drink, kind of forces it on her. At first she looks better, but then she looks like she's having a seizure. He holds on to her and yells for Giles. And we cut to the next day at school, a sunny afternoon. It's 34 and a quarter minutes in, and Jonathan is in the clock tower, and he opens a case with a rifle. So that is definitely a turn in the story, but our friends don't know about it yet, so it doesn't change their actions. Then we see Buffy, who looks like she has been knocked out or sleeping, and she wakes up, and she doesn't hear thoughts anymore, and she seems fine. In the DVD commentary, Jane Espenson said this was the start of the fourth act. She commented that it was a fairly slow build until now, and then it moves very fast. So the four-act structure divides a story roughly into quarters, much the way I like to look at it, though it isn't necessarily exactly the types of plot turns that I am usually talking about. So it seems this is the turn as the writers saw it into the last quarter of the episode, this bringing of Buffy back into the action. At school, Buffy's friends, without Buffy, are confronting Freddy, but it turns out he was hiding only because he thought Oz was mad at him about a review he did of Oz's band where he said they played their instruments as if they had plump Polish sausages taped to their fingers and Oz says no it's fair. Buffy appears in the doorway everyone is relieved that she's fine and can't hear thoughts. Cordelia is looking through pages uh, submitted for the day's paper and she sees a letter that says 
by this time tomorrow, you'll all know what I've done. And it goes on to say, you'll understand I had to do it. Sometimes death is the only way. And it's from Jonathan. The group splits up to look for Jonathan. This piece of good luck, Cordelia finding this letter just because she's going through to see if there's any mention of the cheerleaders, that use of luck works for me for two reasons. One, though there's some happenstance and luck there that she happens to find that, they are in that office because of all the efforts they have made and all the things they have done to figure out who the would-be killer is. So it does arise out of their efforts. It isn't just, oh, good luck, here's a clue. Also, consistent with what I mentioned before, it does send them in a way in a wrong direction. It's an important direction that saves Jonathan's life, but it does not send them to the killer. So it is one of those diversions as well, or red herrings. So I feel like that use of luck works great. We intercut scenes of Jonathan assembling a rifle in the tower with everyone looking for him. Xander is in the lunchroom and is distracted by Jello. So once again, we see Xander not taking this very seriously. Buffy, though, sees Jonathan up in the clock tower. Um, She's on the ground. She runs up the wide railing on the stairwell to avoid all the people on it and does a flip to get up to the roof. Nancy, sitting below, looks and thinks, I could have done that. We now get to what we think is the climax. That is where opposing forces have their final clash and conflict and resolve the main plot. If you are finding the story structure I talk about here helpful, you may want to download the free story structure worksheets. You can find those at the link in the show notes or on writingasasecondcareer.com. Look for the menu item, Help With Your Story. You can also look for my book, Super Simple Story Structure, A Quick Guide to Plotting and Writing Your Novel. It is available in workbook, ebook, or audiobook editions. Or if you are a $5 patron, you can get a copy of Super Simple Story Structure in PDF for free. Patrons also get access to bonus episodes and content, including question and answers. Recently, I recorded a comparison between Willow's character arc with Magic and Jonathan's for the series. If you would like to get access to that or simply support the show, you can do that on Patreon. Use the link in the show notes or go to patreon.com L Lily. So that's double L I double L Y. At 37 minutes, 54 seconds in, Buffy bursts into the clock tower. Jonathan points the rifle at her, tells her not to try to stop him, to go away, but she won't. He gets mad that she keeps saying his name as she's talking to him and says, stop saying it like they're friends, which is something salespeople do that I find really annoying. And Jonathan goes on. We're not friends. You all think I'm an idiot, a short idiot. And Buffy says she doesn't, but she follows up with she doesn't think about him much at all, that no one really does. And he has all this pain and no one's paying attention. She tells him she understands the pain and he scoffs at her, saying something like, oh, right, the burden of being beautiful and athletic, that's a crippler. But she tells him, and she is really angry, that her life sucks beyond the telling of it sometimes. And that everyone is ignoring his pain because they're too busy with their own. And she gives some examples. As she's talking, she then says she could have taken the rifle from him by now. He says he knows. And Buffy says she'd rather do it this way. And he hands it to her. And Jane Esmondson commented on how Buffy gave Jonathan dignity here. She could could have overpowered him and taken it from him by force, but instead she talked with him and let him hand it over. 
Jonathan says he just wanted it all to stop. And Buffy says mass murder, not really recommended for that kind of pain. Jonathan is puzzled. He wasn't going to murder anyone. He came up there to kill himself. So now we discover that what we thought was the climax is not. There is going to be a surprise ending. So more a little bit later on um, the mislead and red herring aspect of this and whether it works. But for now, we'll go to the real climax. It's 41 minutes, 12 seconds in. Xander is looking for more food. He sneaks into the back area, I think, to get a brownie. And he sees the lunch lady pouring poison from a box helpfully labeled rat poison in big letters into the stew. She sees him watching, goes after him with a cleaver. He runs into the seating area and is pulling trays off tables to keep students from eating it. Buffy comes in, fights off the lunch lady who says all the students are vermin. Then we get some wonderful falling action. Again, some of my favorite in all of Buffy. Before that, though, I do want to look at the protagonist questions here because as I was breaking this down, I also thought that might be a little of why this seems a bit uneven. The protagonist I've talked about before should be our main point of view character, should have a goal she actively pursues, and have the most at stake. Buffy qualifies for that for sure here, but there are some issues. She is the main point of view character, but as I mentioned, she is sidelined for a significant part of the action in in a key part of the story. So that undermines that a little bit. There are more issues with a goal. In the beginning, Buffy doesn't have any episode-specific goal. Then she gets this power and realizes she has it, and she pursues a goal of kind of using it for fun and profit. In class, it works. With Angel, it does not. She's quickly thwarted. And then she's sidelined. She, she wants to find the person who thought about killing everyone, but she really cannot do anything. And then she comes back 34 minutes into the episode. So we have about eight minutes left or Yeah, about eight minutes, eight, nine minutes left, and then she is active. Normally, we would see a protagonist much more actively pursuing the goal. She definitely has the most at stake here in a personal sense of losing her mind. But, I mean, we also have these giant stakes of the entire school, we believe, is going to be wiped out. And and those are the stakes uh, for everybody. I think that part works because huge stakes generally means a very gripping story, huge stakes for a whole population. But when you put all that together, I feel like it is also a bit of why the episode just feels less than engaging to me. On the other hand, the misleads, that's where I thought before going into the episode, that's where I thought I would have trouble, that this lunch lady comes out of nowhere, that we have all this misleading stuff. And you definitely need to have misleads in in certain types of stories. That is part of the story, that we have different suspects. There's reason to believe they did certain things. And for the most part here, I do think they work because if you rewatch, the logic fits for all of them. Freddie hides, but if we look, he is is only hiding from Oz. Oz is always the one who goes there and he does have a reason to hide from Oz, a very logical reason. He thinks Oz is coming to complain about or you know maybe castigate him for this review. So that makes sense. Jonathan's letter, if you listen carefully, it does fit suicide as much as mass murder and perhaps more because if he really meant to kill everyone, why would he write to the school paper? He's planning for most of the school to be gone. He would probably write to the local paper. So that does fit. A couple things don't. Why he would be using a rifle to kill himself, that seems I've not made a study of it. I suppose there's a way to do it, but that doesn't quite fit for me. And also, why the clock tower? I guess it's a way to be in the center of everything, but that that seems like it's there just to mislead us. 
all the same, that works okay for me. Um, the lunch lady as the actual culprit. On rewatch, it works better than I thought because there are a couple of those lunch lady references and that one line is specifically to the stew. Normally though, I would like a little bit more to let us know it's the lunch lady, but ultimately the story is not really about the mystery. It is more about Buffy's mind reading and the emotional aspect of that and about Jonathan, about her saving Jonathan. So now we'll go to the falling action. This is where we tie up loose ends, resolve any subplots. Here it's mainly resolving subplots. Willow and Buffy are walking outside near the school. Willow asks how things are with Angel and I love this Buffy tells her pretty good and in explaining how they work things out she says, we talked and then he ripped out the heart of a demon and fed it to me. And then we talk some more. Giles joins them. Willow leaves to turn in the yearbook profiles from those questions. She says it turns out they work pretty well. Um, Giles and Buffy talk about Jonathan, who got suspended. But Buffy says she thinks he's dealing with things she checked on him. So no, we don't get anything about the lunch lady. There's that plot already resolved. So this is all the subplots. Giles asks Buffy if she wants to train after school, and she says, sure, we can work out after school, you know, if you're not too busy having sex with my mother. And Giles walks into a tree, and that is the end of the episode. Jean Espenson said that viewers reacted pretty well to this episode, that they understood that the message was that guns are not the way to solve problems, which is probably why they didn't decide to just pull the episode completely. She did comment that originally she wrote it as Buffy took the gun from Jonathan and then used it to intimidate the lunch lady, but that Joss Whedon said they didn't want a message that guns were okay in a high school at all, like that it was okay for Buffy to have a gun, and they all agreed on that and, and changed the script so Buffy just fights the lunch lady, as she usually would. Just one thing from the DVD interviews about Earshot, and then I'll get to spoilers and foreshadowing. Joss Whedon saw the key message of the show being everyone's ignoring your pain because they're too busy with their own. And he felt like that was the important thing from the episode. And that's part of why I do see it being less about the lunch lady and more about Buffy, what Buffy learns, and about Jonathan because he's the one where that story really plays out. So that is it except for spoilers and foreshadowing. If you're not sticking around for that, and I hope you are, thank you so much for listening, and I hope you will come back next Monday for Choices, where Buffy takes the fight to the mayor. And we are back for spoilers and foreshadowing. First, a very minimal spoiler for Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., another show where Joss Whedon is one of the producers. That comment by Giles that mime reading could be useful in a fight because you could anticipate your opponent's every move. We will see an episode in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. where one of the core characters has to fight an opponent who has mind reading skills and is doing exactly that and she has to figure out how to deal with him being able to anticipate all her moves. Buffy's comment on everyone being in so much pain in the high school, a little foreshadowing of Buffy in season seven being a student counselor. And uh, there's a particular scene where she's talking to a student and trying to tell her that, oh, you know, even the people who are bullying her are in so much pain. And the student is having none of it and just says something like she is really, really sick of people saying that. Like she's supposed to understand the people who are bullying her. Willow interviewing Jonathan and commenting on fantasies about a need for power and respect to be respected and paid attention to so foreshadows Superstar where Jonathan will cast a spell to get exactly that. But it also foreshadows some of Willow's feelings. We get a little of them in season four as well where she feels like she is Buffy's sidekick and she doesn't like it. And 
in season six where she goes up against Buffy and fights her and it's clear some of her anger is about feeling like Buffy is always the more powerful one. Also in the commentary Jane Espenson mentioned in that scene where Willow's handing out the assignments to to go question everybody how Willow is in charge when Buffy can't be and that is when it hit me that this does foreshadow that after Buffy's death at the end of season five we learn that Willow is essentially in charge of the group they make a joke of it like she's the boss of them but this does foreshadow it a bit that and and we've seen this before that Willow is the one who really steps in This issue with Earshot not airing, it's really interesting because when I watched the show as it aired, I don't think I realized there was a missing episode, but I remember being a little confused at how close Buffy and Angel are in choices when in the last episode I had seen in Enemies, she said she needed a break. So it was like they just didn't do anything with that. And then in the prom episode, it's Jonathan who gives Buffy the Class Protector Award. And I don't think I didn't buy that, or I guess I should phrase it, I did buy that because we did see Buffy in minor ways helping out Jonathan, although sometimes he wasn't particularly grateful. But that moment means so much more when we see this start of this personal connection between Buffy and Jonathan, she literally saved his life. It also makes more sense that there is a Class Protector Award because not that many people realized the lunch lady was trying to murder all of them, but there were quite a few people in that cafeteria who saw the fight. So it adds to the idea that, yes, they are aware that Buffy has saved them. I think when I was watching, so I was at the time working full time, going to law school at night, I may have thought that I just missed an episode somehow because I don't believe there was any sort of announcement or anything. I think they just played a rerun. I can see why they did play Earshot before season four started. And I'm, I'm sure I was confused at that point because suddenly I'm watching an episode of them in high school again. You don't necessarily have to have this episode to understand Superstar, but it gives it a lot more context because in Superstar, one of Jonathan's part of his spell he casts where he is so amazing is that he is friends with Buffy. He is part of Buffy's core team. In a way, he's leading that team. And that makes much more sense. Again, when we see this connection between Buffy and Jonathan, also their conversation at the end, you get a little more why Buffy feels like she knows a little bit about Jonathan. So that is it for this episode. Once again, Happy New Year. I hope you had a good holiday season. I know for many people, including me, it was restricted due to COVID-19. But I hope you found a way to enjoy some of it anyway and that the new year is starting well. I also hope you will come back next Monday for Choices where we see more of Faith and the mayor and we see that Willow has more control over her powers. If you would like to comment on the show, you can email me lisa at lisalily.com or tweet me at Lisa Amazon Marie Lily, hashtag Buffy Story. Music for this episode was composed and performed by Robert Newcastle. Buffy and the Art of Story is a production of Spiny Woman LLC, copyright 2020. All rights reserved. Thank you.